All right, welcome to another video. This is Black Swan Revelations. My name is Shane, and today's video, we're going to be continuing on with our Romans series. And we're going to start off in chapter four. So this is the fourth video in this series. So the goal is to try and get through the entire book of Romans because it's so powerful, so powerful. So I just want to jump right into it. So... Romans chapter four, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? So again, we're talking about two groups of people trying to get along. We have the Jews and we have the Gentiles. This is what Paul has been talking about for the past three chapters, saying that we are both in the same boat. <clears throat> and now he's diving a little bit deeper. He's going a layer, one layer deeper now, talking about Abraham. So this is something that for me was revolutionary when I read chapter four. I was like, this is just mind altering. So hopefully this will be like this for you as well. So here's the thing. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? If Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So if Abraham was justified by works, he can brag about it. He can say, you know what? It's because of my works that I am righteous. But Paul says if, if that were true... He could glory in that, but not to God, because there's something else going on. Verse 3, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So this is what made Abraham righteous, was his belief. Not because of works, it's because of his belief. So Paul is going to build a case now that tells us as Christians that we can tap into Abraham's faith and be like Abraham, use the same faith that Abraham had. Look at this. Verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So if you do works unto God, then God has to repay you. This is basically what Paul's saying. So basically, if you do something and you're like, okay, we got to do this work and then God will repay us for how good we are. We're going to do this thing, this thing, and this thing, and this will make us righteous. So God owes us now. He owes us something. So this is what Paul's talking about here. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So now God is in debt to us to repay us because we are righteous through our works. This is the argument that Paul's building here. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him, that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So this is what Paul's saying. It's actually our faith that is counted as righteousness, not works. Because if you do it by works, then God owes you something. But that's not how it works. He has given us grace as a gift to us. It's free. It cost him everything, but for us, it's free. So this is what Paul is saying. God doesn't want to be indebted to us. So instead, he had his son die on the cross for us. And it's a debt that we couldn't even begin to pay back. There's nothing that we can do to pay back that debt. Nothing. And again, this is the point that Paul's trying to make here. So look at this. Verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. This is what Abraham tapped into. He couldn't see his child. 
So what he had to do is he had to believe that God was going to fulfill his promise by giving him an heir, not from one of his servants, but instead from one of his own, from his own bowels, if you will. Even though his body was considered dead, he was an old man. So this is the faith that Abraham had, and it was counted to him as being righteous. It was imputed to him as righteous. So King David even said, Blessed is the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. So our sins, our iniquities are covered because of what one man did. That's Jesus Christ. That's the gift. It's nothing that we did. Again, like Paul said, if we do something, then God owes us. So while we are yet sinners, Jesus died for us on the cross. And when there's nothing we can do to repay him. I can't do anything to repay what Jesus did on the cross. We just have to accept it as a gift. Verse 8, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin, which is us. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned unto Abraham for righteousness. Reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So Abraham was counted as being righteous because of his faith. So now Paul's asking, is this just for the circumcised only? Like just for the Jews? Or could this be for the uncircumcised, which are also known as the Gentiles? That's the question. Who Who's this righteousness for? Is it only for the circumcised? Look at this. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? When was it reckoned? When was Abraham's faith reckoned? Was it when he was circumcised or was it when he was uncircumcised? This is a big deal. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So we have the father of many nations, the father of faith, if you will, that believed. When did he believe? That God was able to do this when he was uncircumcised like a Gentile. Gentiles are uncircumcised. So you can't say faith only comes through those that are circumcised. This is what Paul's trying to hit home. If you could figure this out, you could solve the mysteries of the universe right here, right now. Abraham was saved while he was uncircumcised. And the seal of circumcision was to let people know that he believed in faith, that he had faith. That was the seal of circumcision. He got circumcised because of his belief. And we can tap into that same belief as Abraham because we are uncircumcised. And when we tap into that, we are now circumcised around our heart. We are now Abraham's seed by tapping into that same faith. Let's continue here. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. That's the key. He is the father of all them that believe. That righteousness might be imputed unto them also, unto us. <clears throat> so if we believe, we are exercising that same faith that Abraham had. 
and the father of the circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet been uncircumcised. So now he is our father. He's our father, not only of the circumcision, but he's a father of the uncircumcised. Why? Because that's when he had faith, when he was uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir to the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. Because remember, the law didn't come into effect until like 430 years, 460 years later. Sometime later. But through the righteousness of faith. So it was not to Abraham or his seed through the law. That's not how he inherited. That's not how he became righteous. It wasn't because of the law. Because the law didn't come into effect until later. But it was through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. So if Jews today say that they are saved because of the law, then they're making our faith void and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. So we're going on to verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, to both the Jew and the Gentile. <clears throat> As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be and being not weak in faith he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old neither the deadness of sarah's womb he staggered not at the promise of god through unbelief but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. He was also able to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. <clears throat> and today, you're going to get a two-part video. We're going to go into chapter 5 because this is, this is where it gets really good. <clears throat> All right, so chapter five. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when 
we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. <clears throat> that is a powerful verse. For when we were yet without strength, we we're at the bottom of the barrel, drowning. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely, for righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. This is the whole point that Paul's trying to make. He's like, you know, you could you could maybe build a case for someone to to die for a righteous person. And maybe even a good man. You know, in the right circumstance, somebody can give up their life for a good man. A really good man. <clears throat> but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Which is interesting, right? When you think about it. If we're thinking about someone that, uh, yeah, maybe they're righteous. I don't know. Is it worth to give my life? Be pretty tough. How about a good guy? Someone that's maybe maybe a politician, maybe like Trudeau or maybe Joe Biden. Would you risk your life for him? Maybe that's a bad example. But, you know, somebody that's just that you would say, man, this guy is worth something to this planet. <clears throat> we should at least put a, a, a rescue team together to rescue this person. You can convince people for that. But to die for someone that's a sinner, that's wicked? Oh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. But God did it. God did it while we were yet wallowing in our sin. Because it says in chapter 5, verse 8, Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It wasn't just that he died for us and saved us. It's now we are reconciled by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Things are made right with God and us. Our relationship with God now is intact. We can approach him boldly. Why? Because we are joint heirs in Christ now. <clears throat> this was the whole purpose of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Was to bring us back to his father. Now we are reconciled to God. Because of Jesus Christ's blood that he shed on the cross. This is what justifies us. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Not everyone partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but we still die. Why? Because of that one action that Adam did. And Adam, who is a figure of him that was to come, which is the second Adam, when we go, well, let me just read that again. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Who is the figure of him that was to come? 
but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So, <clears throat> again, with Adam, he did one thing, and everyone dies. So now Jesus did one thing. He died on the cross for us, and not only died, but he rose again on the, on, on the third day. He's alive forevermore. His gift is a little bit different. It's not like the same thing that Adam did. Why? Because we have an abundance of grace. You can't out-sin grace. I know that's going to sound weird to some people. <clears throat> you can think of the worst sin that you've ever done in your life. God has more grace for that sin that you did. More grace. Because where more sin abounds, there's more grace for that. That's the gift. <clears throat> it's unlimited. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. You are forgiven because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So you can't sit back and go, I don't think God can save me. I, I'm, I'm too bad of a sinner. I've done so much. And that's not the idea behind the gift. The gift is an abundance. It's not the same thing as what Adam did. Adam did one thing. That was his gift to humanity. One thing only. Jesus' gift is different. It's an abundance of grace. An abundance. For all the sins you've done, past, present, and future. That's what he's covering up. <clears throat> once you get the gra once you grasp this, again, the whole world will open up to you. So look at this. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, <clears throat> so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they that which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in the life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one man shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That is, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. I know there's lots there. We cover a lot. But again, if we focus on verse 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might bound. What does that mean? <clears throat> you now have the Ten Commandments. You now have all the laws, all the ordinances that show us what we have to do to be righteous before God. So you have all the Ten Commandments, you have all the ordinances, I think there's like 613 of them, but we have them all to show us that if we break one of those, it's like we broke them all. 
But if he broke them all, there's even more grace to cover all those commandments, all those laws that we've broke. That's the abundance of grace. You can't out sin God's grace. And I know I'm probably going to get some messages. What do you mean? Like, can't you lose your salvation? All this kind of stuff. And it's like, once you grasp what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, remember, this is crucial. Jesus can't keep dying for our sins over and over again. If you use... Leviticus, for an example, the high priest would go once, once a year, to atone for the sins for all of Israel, the whole nation. They basically have one year. So yeah, during the year, if they steal from one another, they default, defraud one another, they can make up it for it by giving one of their sheep one of their rams, one of their lambs, all this kind of stuff, peace offerings, everything like that. But the priest, really, at the end of the year, he shows up, he makes an atonement for himself, for his sins for the year, and then also for Israel, the nation of Israel, corporately. Which means he doesn't have to do that again till next year at that time. So they get, they basically have grace for one year. And then the priest will do it again, year after year, until he dies. And then his son takes over. And then that son does it year after year. But the point is, because of Jesus' one-time sacrifice, it's actually greater than any of the sacrifices that the priest could make on behalf of the nation of Israel. Why? Because Jesus Christ's blood is pure. He is the perfect sacrifice. He only needed to do it one time. And because of that one time action, God the Father said, I will justify everyone that believes in your name, that believes that you are my son, that you are the son of God that you are the Savior. It's only through you. That's the rule. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, you now have the same faith that Abraham had when he was believing that he was going to be the father of many nations. And he's considered an example of faith, the father of faith to many nations. <clears throat> because he believed. He believed that God would bring this about. About. So if we understand that God is not a liar, and he says that he will justify anyone that believes in his son, and he passed all judgment, and we'll read about that in the next couple of chapters, he passed all judgment onto Jesus Christ, his son, and Jesus Christ won't judge us, so now who's against us? If God justifies us because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, it's a done deal. It's without repentance, if you will. That may not be the right word, but it's it's basically, it's a free gift. He gave you that gift before you did anything good or bad. That was your gift. So you can accept it. You can accept what he did on the cross and believe that he died for us and rose again on the third day and is alive forever and you're saved. <clears throat> How do we know this? Well, we now have the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. And now we have the convictions of the Holy Spirit as well to testify that we are sealed forever. This is a free gift. It wasn't it wasn't given to us after we repented. That's that's the point I'm trying to make. The gift was given to us before we repented. 
before we did anything good or bad. And I know people are going to miss this. They're going to miss this thing. They're going to just jump on a bunny trail and say, he said no repentance, whatever. And it's like, you got to understand, while you're doing stuff, while you're sinning, in this time, he had already died for your sins 2,000 years ago. So from that perspective, it's done. You just need to accept that he did that for us, that he died on the cross for us, and he's alive and he'll never die again. Once you tap into that belief, welcome to the family. You're in. <clears throat> now you can say, well, what happens if I sin tomorrow? It's covered. What about a month from now? It's covered. What about the sins that I don't know that I've done during the day? It's covered. Because I promise you, most of the things that we've done in the past 24 or 48 hours, most of the sins we've done, we've either forgotten that we've done it until we remember, oh yeah, guaranteed we don't remember anything we did last week, let alone a month ago, a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. So what are you going to do? You're going to beat yourself up now? Remember, Christ died for you 2,000 years ago. So there's no sin that you can do that will separate you from what he did 2,000 years ago. You just have to think about that for a little bit. Meditate on that. Because again, once you believe... And what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. That he shed his blood for us one time. He's not doing that again. Once you tap into that. It just seems reasonable now. To live your life for him. And when you can do that. I'm telling you the whole world opens up to you. You start reading your Bible more because now you're not looking at it like somebody's up there in heaven with a hammer ready to squash you. But you read it with a purpose because you want to know the creator who basically emptied himself from heaven into a human body, created a little lower than angels. What does that mean? It means he could die physically be killed on a cross for you and I so that he could take our punishment. What was supposed to be for us, he took that on himself. Everything that we've ever done in the past, present, and future, one time, because he can't keep dying for our sins. So you have to reconcile that fact that we are reconciled to God with one action that he did. And this gift is a million times, it's a gift that keeps on giving because Adam did one thing and all of us paid for it. All of us. Even though we didn't do the same thing as what Adam did. We didn't pick from an apple tree, if you will. We didn't do that, but yet we still die. So, Jesus Christ did one thing on the cross, and now we have an abundance of grace dished out to us for free every single day. It's just an abundance of grace. It keeps giving. Every second that we're alive, and Jesus even said, said this to Martha, he said, if you believe, whoever believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Martha's like, yeah, I think I get it. But Jesus is trying to explain to her that he was the resurrection. He is the life. He is our life. So he tasted death for us. <clears throat> yes, one day these physical bodies will keel out. But then we're going to be with the Lord forever. Forever and ever and ever will always be of the Lord. That's the beauty about this gift. It keeps on giving. 
we have eternity with Jesus Christ. And this is something that wasn't predicted in the Old Testament. This was a mystery that was revealed to Paul the Apostle. You talk to any Jew in the Old Testament, they're like, yeah, the Gentiles, mm. they really, like, I know in Leviticus it says that we should treat strangers almost like us, especially if they live in our land, or to treat them equal with us, because God said, you are strangers in Egypt. I care for strangers. So you're to treat them with respect. So if you get a Gentile, the Jews didn't like the Gentiles too much. Why? Because they felt like they had the law, they had the circumcision, they had all the ordinances handed down to them from Mount Sinai, and they're like, we're good. This is what saves us. We have the Ten Commandments. We don't need anything else. And Paul just proved in the first three, four chapters of Romans that that won't save you. It's like I made this analogy before. If you blow through a stop sign and you smash into a vehicle and the cop pulls you over and says, I'm going to write a ticket. I'm probably going to write a couple of tickets. One, you weren't safe. Two, you didn't stop. Three, you hurt the person in the car or the vehicle, whatever it is, whatever they do. And you say something silly like, oh, I, I knew the stop sign was there. So I think you should rip up the ticket. And the cop would be like, are you serious right now? I'm going to lock you up because you're insane. Just knowing that there is a stop sign doesn't protect you. It's obeying the stop sign. Pausing for three seconds. Doing a little bit of a... Anybody coming? Good to go. That's what saves you. Obeying. And every one of us have blown through a stop sign at one time or another. That almost sounds like a, a message in itself. You can have a big <clears throat> PowerPoint presentation with the stop sign. We've all done it. We've all blown through red lights. We've all sped through yellow lights. Every one of us. So it's kind of interesting that if you use that as that analogy as an excuse to get out of a ticket, it won't work. In a court of law, they'll look at you like you're crazy. You say, well, I don't deserve this ticket. On what grounds? Well, because I knew, duh, I knew there was a light, duh. They're like, lock him up. Lock him up. And this is how people approach the Ten Commandments in the past. The Jews approach it. They're like, we have the law. We have it. We're safe. We live in Israel. We have a piece of dirt in our hand. We are safe. And Paul is saying in the book of Romans, just because you call yourself a Jew, that doesn't make you a Jew. Not all of Abraham's seed were losing my train of thought. Not all of Abraham's seed was counted as his seed because we also have one of Abraham's other sons, which were Ishmael. But the promise didn't come through Ishmael. It came through his son Isaac. And then... When Isaac had a son, I mean, he actually had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And to make it more clear that it's God choosing on whom to have mercy and who not to have mercy, he chose to have mercy on Jacob to show his providence, if you will. Because he can have mercy on who he wants to have mercy 
and he could not show mercy on people that he doesn't want to show mercy. And people mis misunderstand that. So think about it this way. When God says, I will have mercy on whom I want to have mercy on, on whom I will have mercy on, uh, do you know what he's saying there? He's saying, I will have mercy on those that believe in my son, Jesus Christ. That's the rule. No questions. No questions asked. I don't care how bad you were. I choose to show mercy on those that believe in my son, Jesus Christ. That's who he's choosing to have mercy on. And if you reject his son, he's choosing to not have mercy on people that reject his son. Because that's the only way that you can get saved. That is final. God's like, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And mercy has been granted by believing in Jesus Christ. That's the only way. There's no ifs, ands, buts, no special blessings. If you reject the Son, you reject the Father. If you reject the Father, you reject the Son. If you know the Son, you know the Father. If you know the Father, you know the Son. There's no way to get around that. You can't. There's only one way to be saved, and that's through Jesus Christ. So hopefully you got something out of this. Covered a lot of territory here. But again, it all goes even deeper. Like we get deeper and deeper in each chapter. So I hope you stick around in the next video. Don't know when I'm going to make it. Probably in the next couple of days, maybe on, maybe on Saturday or something. But I'm telling you, Romans, I would encourage you to read it over and over again, man. Because once you realize the love that God had for us, it's just reasonable now to serve him. It's just reasonable. It's reasonable to read his word. It's reasonable to go to church. It's reasonable to fellowship with others, especially those that believe. It's reasonable to love your neighbor as yourself. That's just a reasonable thing to do. It's reasonable to have mercy on people. Why? Because we've been shown so much mercy. It never ends. The mercy that's on us right now. We are joint heirs with Christ. We are seated in heavenly places. One day we will be judging angels. Think about that one for a while. All right. I'm going to sign off. Hope you got something out of it. If you have, you've gained a greater appreciation for the book of Romans. Let me know that as well. If you think I missed something or said something incorrectly, let me know that in the comments. Let me know you watched the whole video. <laughs> and let me know where you're watching these videos from. I really appreciate it. See you later.